and hand it over to Kathy and Rob. All right, well, welcome to the latest presentation in the National Telehealth Resource Center's webinar series, providing timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth program, presented on the third Thursday of each month. Next slide, please. Rob, can you flip to the next slide? Anyway, there we go. Um, located throughout the country, the 12 regional telehealth resource centers supported by two national resource centers serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Next slide, Rob. Today's presentation is Telehealth and Workplace Health, Better Care and Lower Cost, presented by Rob Sprang, Director of the Kentucky Telecare, um, Chair of the Kentucky Telehealth Network Board of Directors, and member of the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center Advisory Board. And without further ado, I will punt to Rob Sprang. Thanks, Kathy. Um, well, good afternoon to everybody that's on the right side of the country, and good morning to everybody that's on the left. That's not a political statement whatsoever. Uh, I just know it's morning time out in the West. So, and thanks to Becky and Kathy both for making this so easy. I, I, as much as I try to screw this up, they've made it so easy that I don't think even I can make a mess of this. So uh, thank you guys for putting this together and taking care of all the details in the organization. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm accustomed to having to, give academic talks to people. And so we always have to have objectives. And so uh, I want you to understand the growing interest in work-based, workplace-based health programs, understand the motivation of a large company to develop a workplace health program. Um, and we're gonna do this from the perspective of a company that is actually based in uh, Oklahoma, but has corporate offices also in Kentucky and has offices in eight other states. And then I want you to understand the impact that telehealth can have on a program like this. Uh, and at the end, we'll present some quantitative outcomes of the program just to show how well this program has worked for the company. And why is this important? Um, Self-insured companies are the future of what healthcare is going to be. Um, you know, we're moving, we'll talk about this a little bit further, but we're moving from a volume-based healthcare system to a value-based healthcare system. The thing is that self-insured companies are already there uh, and have been there forever. They are completely focused on programs that reward health outcomes and cost containment. And just financially, they're penalized for poor outcomes and other metrics that drive up the cost of healthcare. And we as telehealth professionals have an opportunity to play a pretty significant role in workplace health programs. And this is an opportunity for you guys to get out front and lead. So if you're not doing anything in the workplace, uh, providing telehealth in workplace uh, programs, this is a great opportunity for you guys to do something different. And I think in some cases you'll find an opportunity to really generate revenue. Um, you guys may have seen this slide before, but, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody that the United States spends way more than everybody else on healthcare. Um, you know, almost 50% more than even the next highest uh, country around the country in Norway. And if you look at the average, which is about $3,200 and we're paying $8,200. What I don't have is a slide that shows our outcomes. And you guys probably don't need me to tell you that we don't necessarily have better outcomes in a lot of these places. Um, and yet we're spending an incredible amount of money more than what most others do. Um, this was a slide that, um, that somebody brought to me uh, some time ago. And I gotta tell you, this, I, I knew that healthcare premiums had gone up but this was somewhat of a surprise to me. I've been working in an academic medical center for 20 years. And I gotta tell you, we're, we, the, our organization does a great job of insulating me from increasing healthcare costs. Uh, I'm not paying much more for healthcare premiums than I did 20 years ago. 
But if you look at the time frame of this study from 1999 to 2012, you can see the, you know, the bottom line is simple overall inflation. And so obviously there's been inflation, but over the course of 13 years, it went up uh, 38%. And then you see the next line down at the bottom of the chart, which is workers' earnings. So workers, we have, as workers make a little bit more than inflation, so we've kept in front of inflation. But then if you look at the top two lines, this is pretty extraordinary. Um, the orange line is the worker's contribution to our health care premiums. And then the, the other line is health insurance premiums. And, and I think what's really striking is that employers have deferred more of the increase onto employees. So we are paying a higher percentage and a higher rate of the increase than the employers have. Um, again, I'm really lucky that I pay about the same as I did uh, even 20 years ago. But in this model, if an employee in 1999 were paying, say, $200 a month for health care premiums, over the course of this chart time to 2012, that same employee would be paying $560 a month for that same premium. Um, it, Obviously, it's a problem, but especially a problem from the healthcare or from an employer's perspective. And so, we're going to go through a Towers and Watson survey that you guys may have seen uh, that was done in 2012, but it represented 74 companies and 1.7 million employees. And the concerns from these companies, first and foremost, was rising healthcare costs, you know, in some cases, double digit healthcare costs. The employers are concerned about access to primary care for their employees. I mean, certainly today, for many of us, if we want to take off work to go to the doctor, that's a half a day. I mean, that's a half a day of productivity. And so the employers are concerned. Um, they need to keep workers healthy and productive. And, productive. and why would they consider an on-site health care center? Um, their number one response was to enhance worker productivity. And, you know, I understand within an organization, sometimes when you're assessing an employee's ability, their availability may be the most important ability that they have. It, just being there and being present at the office. So it's, it's important that we find ways to keep people accessible and available in their office. Now, the other issues, reduce medical costs, 57%, improve access to care, 42%. And for sites that already offer on-site care to their employees, you know, the vast majority of them offer biometric screening. Only 8% currently, now again in 2012, offer telemedicine, but 28% are planning telemedicine in the future. And the healthcare conundrum is, I, and, and I've used this, um, this diagram to kind of describe a little bit about what I see is happening in, your, in, in the industry right now, that we all are facing, say, a continuum of healthcare. From the left, traditional healthcare was completely oriented to numbers. More patients, more money. More surgery, more money. Uh, more visits to the emergency department, more money. If you look on the right side, in a reformed healthcare system, we're all focused on the triple aim. And, and again, just to reiterate, triple aim is improving the healthcare experience of the patient, includes satisfaction and quality. It improves the health of the population, not just one patient at a time, but focus on the whole population. And finally, reducing per capita cost of healthcare. Now, as you look at this um, continuum, there is going to be a point when we leave traditional healthcare and we move to a reformed healthcare system. Um, it would be a whole lot easier for us, I think, if there was truly a flash cut where we moved from a volume based healthcare system to completely to a value based, because in many cases, the ends in both of those and the means to get to the ends of those are very different. Um, in a traditional healthcare system, you want people to go to the emergency room. 
it's the highest cost and the highest margin place to deliver health care. In a reformed healthcare system, we're penalized for people going to the emergency room. So the challenge is, when is that point in time when we are late, when we have left the old system and we have moved to a reform system? Now, is that point where the arrow is there? Is it over here? Is it over there? The problem is, it's not a point in time. It's this, and I call it a kind of an amorphous cloud where we are stuck in the middle somewhere where some payers are gonna be focused on a volume-based healthcare system where they pay for fee-for-service. Others are gonna be in a reformed healthcare system where we truly are paid for value. And so the challenge is how do we treat different patients at different times under two entirely different models and financially make this work? I, I think the key that we have to remember is that we have to move to the reformed healthcare system. And while there's still a significant number of payers, and I can tell you within our state, we are very much a pay for um, a fee for service state. There is very few pay for value contracts that are out there. And so whether it's Medicaid, private insurance companies, almost everything that we do is still fee for service. It's a real challenge to move away from one model and move into the other. But the future is here with self-insured employers. Uh, the new reformed healthcare system is gonna focus on value and not volume. It's gonna emphasize healthcare and, and not sick care. You know, we, most of us don't work in the healthcare industry, we work in the sick care industry. Um, and we have to move in the new healthcare system onto true healthcare. Uh, you guys are very well aware of payments and penalties for clinical outcomes and cost avoidance. You know, the first thing that happened in that environment was that we, uh, we saw CMS stop paying for um, hospital-based or hospital-acquired infections. I think that happened in about 2008. And that was the first step in this pay for value. So we knew that we had to begin to move in that direction. Now today you see that we are penalized for hospital readmissions. And so we've got to be aware of the new model and how do we succeed in that model. Uh, under a new model, the medical home, the patient-centered medical home and care coordination is gonna be critical and we're all gonna be held accountable. Uh, Self-insurance healthcare plans have had those same objectives, not only today, but years ago. And so it's a really interesting incubator model to begin to work to prepare for what we're going to be dealing with in the future. And telemedicine should be a foundational element. I mean, we should be able to wrap telehealth around everything we do. And if we're able to embrace employers today and to be successful in building this kind of a model, that's going to translate into the broader healthcare marketplace as all, as all insurance companies and payers embrace the new pay-for-value system. Now we talk about a coal miner's health. Um, it's, I, I want to also qualify at the beginning of this program that this is a unique industry. You don't all have access to uh, coal mining companies or mining companies. It, it's an interesting, population to deal with. It is a relatively unhealthy population to deal with. And so if you're gonna compare Alliance Coal that we work with today versus a tech startup in uh, California, the employees and the health needs are gonna be very different. So I realize that there will be differences in these employees, but I think to some extent, it's gonna translate through to everybody. Just to give you a sense, um, and when I say these guys, it is almost exclusively men that work in the mines. Um, there are certainly women that work in administrative and leadership positions. But most of the people that are doing the heavy lifting down in the coal mines are going to be men. It's an incredibly taxing job, uh, not just physically, but psychologically. I mean, in some cases, these guys are underground 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, I've been in the mines and, and I couldn't work there. There's just no way. Uh, so I understand what they may be going through. 
or stressful working conditions, limited access to healthcare resources. Most mines, most coal mines are going to be found in very rural parts of the country. Um, and if you're underground for 10, 12 hours a day, the last thing you want to have to do is go to the doctor or go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. These employees have generational health problems, and, and whether you want to blame it on the individuals themselves, their lifestyle choices in many cases. They eat too much, they don't exercise, a lot of smoking, so there are all kind of lifestyle choices that can contribute to this. They're reluctant to get health care, and it's not because, I, th I think, you know, personally, I think these are tough guys that work underground, and they just don't go seek health care unless they are really sick. They're not engaged in their own care. And they also hear some of the health care metrics, blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose, um, that doesn't resonate with them. It just doesn't mean anything. You know, blood pressure of 180 over 100 doesn't, doesn't mean anything to them. They are less concerned for their own personal health but they are all concerned about taking care of their family. And so um, this will come back to us a little bit as this program was launched, but uh, we tapped into some of that with these guys. Just, just a very brief bit about Alliance Resource Partners. It, it's a large coal company, fourth largest in the Eastern United States. They've got mining operations in several states and administrative offices in Tulsa and Lexington. And as we looked at this company, um, we, we, we assessed what was going on with the employees, the miners themselves. Highly skilled people, many of them very experienced. Um, the average coal miner is 50 to 55 years old, so they've been in the business a long time. And what a lot of people don't realize, these guys are not carrying picks and shovels. Uh, they're dealing with multi-million dollar pieces of equipment, and they're bringing coal out of the mine in tens and hundreds of tons a day. Not, you know, they're, they're not strapping this thing on their back. They're not putting it in a small mining car. They're pulling a lot of coal out of the mine. So these are very valuable resources to the company. Healthcare costs are rising, and in their case, it was about nine to ten percent a year and catastrophic medical events were increasing significantly. But, and, and this is really important. I want you guys to think about this a little bit before I go to the next slide. The highest cost in their healthcare system was end-stage cardiovascular disease. But when you looked at the data from their health insurance company, there was a low prevalence of risk factors. So it was really hard to justify how could you have all these people with massive cardiovascular events, end-stage cardiovascular events, and yet there was a low prevalence of risk factors among the employees. Now, the extent of the problem, we, we discovered what the problem was. The third-party administrator controlled all the data, but the only data that they could provide us was claims data. So these were only the the employees that went to the doctor, which again we said are very few. So if you've only got claims data, you don't really get the full uh, story. So as you look at two primary issues of cardiovascular disease, blood pressure and cholesterol, if you look at the claims data, only 15% of the employees have high blood pressure. Only 12% of the employees have high cholesterol. Now, if you did a health risk assessment and allowed them to self-report, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? 20% said yes of high blood pressure, 26 said high cholesterol. Now again, that still doesn't resonate with the kind of numbers that they were seeing on end-stage cardiovascular disease. So we launched a pilot program and you can see a quote from one of, the, one of the leaders in the company, the cost of doing nothing was greater than any solution we could devise. So in 2005, they realized we have to do something. The pilot was to wrap around five coal mines in the southeast part of the state. Uh, the College of Medicine in UK and our telemedicine office built a small mobile clinic and outfitted it with telehealth. Uh, 
they brought upon, along a local family medicine doctor that had been in the community for 50 years to help oversee the care of the patients. But a nurse practitioner drove the mobile clinic. So she drove the clinic to one mine site one day a week, saw the employees in the, in the clinic, and then anytime they needed to see a doctor, they brought them in by telehealth. Maybe most importantly in this program, they launched an employee health risk assessment plan. And the idea for the, for the concept of the program itself was to look at spending for healthcare. You can imagine that as the rectangular box. And today, and again today being 2005, they spent very little on well care, spent most of their money on sick care. The concept was to increase primary and secondary prevention, focus on well care, spend more money on well care, spend less money on sick care, and hope that there's cost savings at the end of the tunnel. Now, it's also really interesting to note that we're all about evidence-based practice, and we're all about data. This company had no data. They had nothing to prove that if they were gonna make this kind of an investment, I'll talk a little about the investment later, that this was going to reap benefits to them. And I talked to the guy, Paul Mackey, that you saw his quote earlier. Had this not worked out, Paul wouldn't still be working for the company um, because he spent millions on this program to set it up. What I can tell you, he spent millions, it benefited the company, um, and not only does he still work for the company, but he's one of the top leaders in the company. There's a picture of the van itself. Uh, there's a picture of the back of the clinic itself. And then there's a view of the back of the mobile van. Um, and you can see the video conference system. Um, and that's the doctor who looks into the clinic. Um, and guys, and I apologize. The, uh, uh, the, the, the screens are running ahead of me, and I don't know why, but I'm, I'll do my best to keep up with it. But that is our primary care doctor using telehealth to actually look in the back of this mobile clinic when it's parked at one of the coal mines. Now, the actual data, we talked about this a little bit earlier. This is really important. Um, you saw the data before, whether it was claims data or the self-reported data. In 2010, when they began to launch the health risk assessments, they looked at the biometrics for these patients. And so high blood pressure wasn't 15%, wasn't 20%, it was 84%. High cholesterol wasn't 12 or 26%, it was 93%. Once you got to the data, you began to realize why they have such an impact of these high cardiovascular events and why it costs the company so much money. Now, I want to show you, you know, we're, we, we want to get back down to the bottom line, which is how much money can be saved. Um, beginning in 2007, when we began to roll this project out, um, this company, and I don't have the figures for it, but they spent over $100,000 on the mobile clinic, they spent over $100,000 on a nurse practitioner, and then they brought on this family medicine doctor to work with them. They spent a pretty significant amount of money. Um, and a lot of that investment, that capital investment that you see is reflected in 2008 and 2009. So what we have are two columns, per member per month charges were the changes from previous year. Um, and then over to the right, it's Alliance Coal versus the industry average. So the industry average was up 9% per year for healthcare cost. Alliance Coal from 2000 to 2008 went up 10 and a quarter. So my guess is that Paul Mackey was a little bit nervous the first year because the industry went up 9%, they went up 10 and a quarter. So the company, healthcare cost went up 1.25% more than the industry. The second year, it went up 18.69, almost double the industry average at the time. Um, and you may wonder why, how could that happen? It was certainly part of it was infrastructure. Um, the other part of it was, and you saw in the slide earlier, we had a huge amount of latent disease that was undiagnosed in the patients. And all of these, heart attacks and strokes that were waiting to happen 
we're now diagnosed as having cardiovascular, uh, heart and lung problems, all kind of medical outcomes that were coming, but they were able to uncover them early. And some of that money, that increase in cost, was now giving people high blood pressure medicine, cholesterol medicine, all kind of medicine that was going to impact their health care and overall improve that care. And what you see is that the cost curve broke in 2010. Their health care costs went up 2.9%, and that was 7% less or, or 7 points less than the industry average. And then 2011, the cost curve really broke. They actually dropped per member, per month healthcare costs, 6.7%. And at an industry average going up 9%, that was 15% less than the industry. Nobody does that. I mean, I'm, I never met a company that said we actually lowered per member, per month healthcare costs. So it's an extraordinary feat that, and it took time to build up to that, but you can see they built the infrastructure and it happened. Other spending impacts, over this course of time, primary care and preventative care spending went up 117%. So that it went up a lot. But major hospital events, the things that were really killing them financially, and unfortunately were killing the workforce, those events that cost $50,000 and up went down 40%. So we had some early success in the program um, and actually caused us to abandon the mobile clinic. The mobile clinic was so successful and healthcare on site was so successful and the telehealth connectivity was so successful that the company made the decision, we don't want the van or a clinic there one day a week, we want a clinic there every day of the week. So the mobile clinic was abandoned uh, the health clinic was created in each facility in eight states, and every one of those clinics had a nurse or a nurse practitioner, and every site had telehealth capability. Uh, the local fam family medicine doctor that we talked about was brought in to run the program full time, and he was accessible to every one of the clinics via telehealth every day, all day. Uh, this company has a no pay, no copay, no deductible, no cost to the employee program. Uh, pharmaceuticals are delivered to the workplace. And you know, some of you guys may have experienced this before, but most employers are moving to high deductible, high copay programs. And the idea is to incent the employee to be a better shopper. So the the emphasis is now put on you to find the best value in a doctor, in a procedure. My guess is, and in talking to this company, there is no data that shows that that improves the cost and the outcomes of healthcare. What it does do is some people are not gonna pursue primary care, some people are not gonna pursue preventative care or continuity of care, because until you hit that, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 deductible, it's all coming out of your pocket. Now, there are some companies that let you set up health, um, health savings accounts. Problem is, that's in many cases still your money. Uh, so a lot of people will not pursue that key primary and preventative care in these new high deductible plans because it's money out of your pocket. This company not only doesn't have costs to the employees, but they make it easy. You know, of course, telehealth brings care right to the employer uh, location, but pharmaceuticals are delivered to the workplace. You don't even have to go to the drugstore to pick up your pharmaceuticals. Uh, they also provide easy access to care for families. So if you're sick, go to work. If a family member is sick, go to work. And so it builds this, you know, kind of, I don't know, mentality that work is there to help me. Work is there to take care of my family. They deploy health risk assessments every year. And probably one of the most exciting, and I was really impressed with this, the patient engagement went up. But it didn't go up by talking about blood pressure, cholesterol level. 
it went out by talking about heart age. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further. That was the one metric that resonated with patients. And then, of course, telehealth is used for specialty services. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about productivity. And, you know, we, we, we also talked about sometimes an employee's best ability is just availability. If you look at 2008, and I've not done any kind of research, is there, did they have a high number of absence days or that absent index, which is absent days by employee per month? Um, my guess is that people in the coal mines probably do have a relatively high absence rate because it's tough work. Um, but you can see from 2008 to 2009, during the deployment of this workplace health program, changes in absences went down 3%. You know, you, you can probably write that off as a statistical error. What you can't write off is what happened in 2010, where there's a 20% change, a 20% reduction in absences from 2008. That's not a rounding error. That's not a statistical anomaly, that's real. And again, these guys are underground, bringing out tens and hundreds of thousands of tons of coal every day. Every worker that is in the mine is, is critical. And you know, you, you guys probably have read the, the, the stress that the coal industry is under, and it is right now. It's a tough time for anybody in energy, but especially in coal. But that also means that every single employee that is left is even more critical to the company. So productivity measured by this absence uh, rating is really important. Um, there's, I think we have three charts that we're gonna show that talk a little bit about how this program impacted the patients. Um, and, and I know the yellow line may be a little difficult to read, but there are three lines here. Anybody that is on the red line, those are employees that have a cholesterol level that is high enough that they deem it needs to be fixed. Anybody that's in the yellow line, it's not bad enough that they will, that they will give them medication normally, but it's bad enough that we need to watch them. And so if that person's cholesterol begins to trend up, then we're gonna be a little more aggressive. And then at the bottom are the people that are okay. Now, again, this is all in percentages. Let's just start at the bottom. Um, when they started the program, 3% of the employees had an okay cholesterol level. Uh, that's not a very significant number. Um, and you can see the number has trended up a little bit, 3 to 4 to 8% over three years. Um, but it's more than double the percentage of people that have good cholesterol. And you can look at the red line, which is significantly trended down. So 61% of the employees had a cholesterol level in the first year that needed to be fixed. At 39% after four years needed to be fixed. Now you look at the yellow line and you go, yeah, but that line trends upward. That line trends upward because we have moved patients from a point where we needed to fix them to a point where we needed to watch them. And my hope is over time, we will see that bottom green line get higher and higher as we see people moving off the yellow line down to the green line. So I hope that that makes sense. I, I can tell you from the company's perspective, it makes great sense to them. Blood pressure was another one that we talked about, cardiovascular problem. And you can see that the patients that had a real problem, those on the red line, have dropped from 28 to 23%. Again, blood pressure probably, I don't know whether it's a more difficult problem to fix. I don't think that the change we had in blood pressure is dramatic, but we dropped from 28 to 23%. Certainly the patients that were okay, that had acceptable blood pressure, went from 18 to 23%. So they had a significant uptick. And then what you actually see is the patients that are okay, I'm sorry, the patients that we need to watch have really remained relatively steady. Over four years, we ended up from 54 to 
So some of those patients have left the red arrow, have gone to the yellow arrow, and some have moved down into the green. So obviously a positive trend for them. And this is one of the things that um, I found really interesting. You couldn't convince most employees about blood pressure or, or any of those other metrics, those health metrics that a doctor may talk to a patient about to let them know you have a problem, we need to fix it. But the thing that resonated with the employees was to use the Framingham Heart Age. And I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it tells you how old your heart is versus how old you are in calendar years. And so I'm 58. And if the doctor told me your heart is 70, that meant that my heart age is 12 years older than my age. That's a number I get. I mean, it's not hard to understand that you are, your heart is 12 years older than the rest of your body, and you need to do something about that. So what you can see is we have three cohorts. We have a, a, a three-year cohort, a two-year, and a one-year cohort beginning in 2009, 10, and 11. And the three-year cohort, um, we moved from an average of 5.5 years of heart age older than your calendar age to 3.4 years. So you're trending pretty closely back to um, your heart age being the same as your calendar age. And then you can see the two-year cohort and one-year cohort had pretty much the same kind of impact. So one year into a program with these employees, you're seeing a significant downward trend. And the idea eventually is that your heart age is the same age, and if you're really healthy, uh, your heart age is actually younger than your physical age. Okay, now the numbers. What was the bottom line impact on this company? And so we, we have numbers from 2013 and 14. And I, I, I just find this fascinating. The company in 2013 spent almost $82 million on healthcare. In 2014, they spent almost $78 million in healthcare. It's so roughly $4 million reduction. And yet they had more employees from one year to the other. So 505 more employees, yet they spent $4 million less in healthcare. And if you look at the bottom line, the bottom, bottom row of this is that's where the money is. This company reduced per member, per month cost of healthcare, $498, went down 8.3%. It's again, extraordinary change. Now, what are we gonna, you know, they did some more um, investigation and they found that 96% of the plan participants spent in 2013, 57% of the total cost of healthcare, $46 million. Um, there isn't that significant of a change from year to year, but what you see is that 4% of the employees spend 43% of all the healthcare costs in 13 and 48% in 14. Let me just dig into this a little bit and let you see what this, um, what this really means. In one year, in 2014, the group of employees that spent zero to $5,000 is a little over 11,000 employees. 80% of the total plan participants spent 21% of all the money in the health plan. And you look down the line more and more. The bottom, group three, that spent over $150,000 in health care in one year is only 0.2% of the total plan participants. And if you look at the raw number, it's only 38 people spent $11.5 million. So as we look forward, where's the opportunity for improvement? It's in those bottom two groups. How do we get a handle on cost in those bottom two groups? Um, can you wrap your arms around 38 employees and try to have an impact on that $11.5 million? or even 497 employees and wrap your arms around them to improve cost or improve the expenses for them. So the plan 
is that they're, and, and we're gonna start working with them in April this year to look at opportunities. Again, this program is built, the foundation of this program where the primary care doctor is built on telehealth. There is also specialty consultations from telehealth, but really the vast majority of telehealth is done from the primary care center. Um, what we are expecting in the next year or two is that we're gonna look at remote patient monitoring. How do we do continuity of care with that small number of patients? That, you know, under 50 patients that spend $11 million a year. So in conclusion, um, the healthcare systems and payers are changing their focus, um, but self-insured companies are already there. I mean, that is the model that you can work with today. The successful deployment of workplace health is going to springboard you to be successful with commercial payers and, and your Medicaid, Medicare programs as they move to value-based healthcare. And workplace health programs are emerging. You saw it in one of the early slides. More and more people are gonna do this. You ought to take advantage of it. The benefits of the company were simple. I mean, you saw the dollars. Reducing per member per month cost was simple. Benefits of the patient, not hard to figure out. You improved the healthcare of the patient. You provided easy access to care and you avoided high out-of-pocket costs. I can see if this company never deployed this kind of a program in the future, you would have seen them go to a high deductible plan and you would have seen high out-of-pocket out costs for the employees. And then finally, the benefits, and, and again, that this may be the, the bottom line for you guys, the benefits to UK and the benefits to my telehealth program we created incredible goodwill for this organization. Um, I'm not gonna say, and telehealth did not, was not the only reason this worked. You had a company that was really committed to this. This is also a company that is very vested at UK. Um, over the years, the CEO of this company has given a whole lot of money to UK. Um, and this helped foster even more goodwill. Because I can tell you, you go to this company, and they thank us for the work that they, we did building the pilot of the telehealth program that eventually led to the rollout of their workplace health program. Um, we do some specialty encounters for telehealth, but I think the greatest financial benefit that has come from this company is that we are now considered the center of excellence for most specialty and subspecialty care. And when they have the big, complex cases, whether it's surgeries or procedures or whatever it may be, those employees often from five, six, seven, eight states are gonna to come to UK because of the, the structure and the foundation that we've built over time. So we have benefited and we, the university and the University Health Center have benefited greatly from those employees and that company. I think we're going to open it up for questions in just a second. Um, guys, if you want to, uh, I think you guys were going to uh, field the questions and forward them on to me. Yeah, um, this is Becky. So on the bottom of your screens, for those of you that are participating in today's webinar, if you roll your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you should see a little uh, icon for Q&A. And that is the best way for you guys to ask questions. We have so many people on that it's um, very difficult to field questions via audio. So if you would go ahead and type your questions in and we'll start answering them. Becky, you're going to forward those on to me. I apologize because I'm not looking at the chat screen. No, that's fine. Nobody's writing a question yet, so that means that I need to ask a question. That will, oh, we got one. Everybody's always uh, afraid to ask the first question. Uh, first question, are we able to get a copy of this presentation? Uh, yes, absolutely. We, we have uh, captured your email addresses if you registered for today's uh, event, and we can send those out via email. 
what is what telehealth software is most used? Oh, that's a good one, Rob. Um, it, you know, it's funny for this company. Um, we we are now again. Keep in mind, we started in two thousand five, so there was really no such thing as software. Uh, the company started out using traditional Polycom codecs, um, all IP-based video system connectivity, um, and they have stuck with traditional codecs. Um, they purchased, they, they did a complete renovation of their technology, I think three years into the program, and they went with Cisco. But at this point, they are still using all hardware-based codecs. I told you, they spent a lot of money. All right, we got another question. How is the cost per patient for the general public or the cost savings? Um, so you're asking, does this translate to a traditional environment outside of, of say, the workplace. Is that what you're thinking the question is? Yeah, I'm thinking it, it's better. What is, yes, the general public. So what is the cost savings per patient for the general public? You know, that, uh, good question. Um, as you, you know, as you consider telehealth, um, the, I, I always have believed the real beneficiary is the patient. Um, the patient doesn't have to travel. The patient is, is able to stay in their home community. If the patient is working, they miss less time from work. Um, that's the real beneficiary of the community health care facility where the patient may be seen by telehealth, uh, I think is probably the second beneficiary because they are able to capture lab work, radiology studies, things that normally they would have lost uh, when that patient traveled. Um, and, and then of course the, the, the provider that is connected benefits by maybe seeing patients they normally wouldn't see. But you know, I don't believe that a telehealth encounter is necessarily takes less time than a traditional encounter. So, um, you know, I, I think that what you'll find is that certainly the actual cost um, of a telehealth encounter to the payer community is going to be the same as a traditional encounter. Um, the one benefit would be in the Medicaid environment where Medicaid does pay travel costs. And in our case, you know, we're a fairly small state. We only have 42 or 4.2, 4.3 million people in the state. Our Medicaid travel budget uh, for healthcare is somewhere in the order of 70 or $80 million a year. So we think telehealth will have an opportunity to reduce that. We have no data on that whatsoever. Um, I think from a payer community, again, we're, we're comparing this to a self-insured company. So the ultimate payer is the company that is self-insuring all their employees. Uh, I think from a payer's perspective, I think patients in telehealth will probably be seen quicker, probably be diagnosed quicker, probably be treated quicker, and so there will be less of an incidence of the large acute incidences that would cost a lot more money. So, you know, whether it's traditional telehealth where we see them on TV, whether it is uh, direct-to-consumer telehealth, whether we're using telehealth as remote patient monitoring in the home to avoid hospital admissions or readmissions, um, you know, the beneficiaries, I think, are going to be the payers. I don't think there's a lot of good data out there. You know, Kathy, you, you, you probably know this better than I do. Um, everybody that wants to sell their own software or hardware will come up with a an answer, but I'm not sure that there's a lot of really good data out there that where the, where the necessary the savings are. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I, but I believe there are savings, absolutely. Uh, the next question um, 
was about the, the specific example of the coal mining company and if they um, the company allows family members of those workers to be seen via telehealth. Absolutely. That's, you know, the, again, the, the company self-insures not only the employees, but their dependents. And so now this, these clinics are not open to the general public, but they are open to beneficiaries of the health plan of the company. So absolutely. You know, I, I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, look, my kids are grown, so I'm past that. But I, you know, I remember what incredible disruption one of your children has when they get sick. Well, with this company, if you are sick or a family member is sick, you go to work uh, because that's where you get your first line of health care. And in some cases, through telehealth, the second and third line, all the way up to tertiary and quaternary care. So, uh, Basing, this, basing um, benefits on not only employees, but the family members and the, the other beneficiaries was critical to this company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to let you know, we've got seven different questions that are still open and still more coming in. Um, so I'm going to kind of pick and choose a little bit. I will try and answer some via text if I think it's a pretty standard answer. Um, but uh, Rob, I'd like you to ask or answer this one. Like the work, workplace telehealth program, has there been discussion of telehealth in er, elder care homes like nursing homes? Yeah, you know, I would like to say that, look, I, I always, I, I've said this, I don't know why I've said this in email several times. I'd like to say that we do telehealth in every vein better than everybody else. We don't. Um, I just referred some people that were really interested in school health to um, Dr. Steve North because I, I think he is the guy that does that better than anybody. Healthcare in long-term care centers is not something that we have done much of. We've done a little bit. We've done a couple pilot programs years ago. Um, we have not done a good job with that. We, we do some memory disorder uh, services into long-term care centers, but I got to tell you, the, excuse me, the real benefit to this is delivering primary care. I mean, you start with primary care and then you roll in secondary and tertiary care on top of that using telehealth. But I think the opportunities in, in long-term care centers are great. There just hasn't been a push within my organization or, or much of a demand from the local uh, nursing facilities for that. But yes, if, I tell you, if you're thinking about that, uh, I know that uh, Kathy and Becky probably know people that are doing this that they can refer you to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, Kathy, if you've had any pro, um, experience with nursing homes. I've got some nursing homes I'm trying to work with, um, but a lot of times it's what they really want to do is keep the same provider that they're working with in the traditional method and get them get that provider to work via telehealth and that's not always the easiest thing to do. Yeah, we've got a couple nursing homes that are doing telehealth um, primarily for like wound care and some of those other uh, management issues. Um, but we, we do have a lot of interest and part of the problem with the long-term care facilities is the reimbursement piece um, as well as the uh, broadband access piece because right now um, Skilled nursing facilities don't qualify for some of the rural health care um, money programs. Um, and so, but I know that there is broad interest among the skilled nursing and other um, nursing home type facilities in telehealth because it does prevent a lot of the issues with having to transport patients and particularly patients who are um, weak or frail or have memory issues. I think if you guys are interested, if anybody out there is interested in this, I think you can email any of us. We will find you somebody that does it. Absolutely. Um, I'm answering some general questions here, but let me find another question for you to work on, Rob. Um, other industries. So the, the on-site clinic for um, this particular type of employer, what other industries do you see this translating to? You know, I, I cannot imagine any self-insured employer that wouldn't benefit from this. Um, look, we, you know, you, you, I hate the term perfect storm, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, 
this is an industry where the employees are incredibly in incredibly poor health that you saw um, these are employees that do not pursue health care normally but I can't and, and, and I think the other key to this is that in the mining industry and as you guys look for employers these employees are physically located close to one another I mean, if there's a mine, they're all going to be located within a few miles of that mine site. Um, it's there, it's not a mobile workforce like many of us who you may travel all over. Um, th this worked out really well because you could plant primary care clinics with a nurse practitioner at the mine site, and you could serve all the employees and all of the family members. Um, in a mobile workforce, it's different. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do this. You know, if you're not familiar with some of the direct-to-consumer technologies, there are a lot of employers who are beginning to embrace where your any smartphone or tablet or computer is your telehealth uh, device. Um, we can argue all day about uh, some that do that and whether it's good medicine and what medical peripheral devices you need, but. I would certainly look at any any industry where the employees are physically geographically located close to one another because and and again I think that any industry uh, you know heavy industry that kind of workplace I, I think would be a great opportunity I you know if you if you go after you know young startup tech sector I mean that's the working well I mean that those are people that you know, they probably don't go to the doctor very often, probably don't need to go to the doctor very often. But if you look at people that especially have difficult, challenging chronic disease problems, I, I, I can't see how you could win with a program like this. Mm -hmm. um, next question, um, the sp specific system back with the example of the coal mining company, um, how did they collect uh, specimens for lab work? They have a contract with uh, different lab companies, and and I got to tell you, I don't know about the transportation issues, but just based on um, what a clinic would do, you know, they, I, I think what you find is that they have a large enough population base, um, you know, very easily five, six, seven hundred people in a in a mine region site. Uh, where they would justify pickup from a lab, but yes, they they will contract. They contract with local labs. They contract with local hospitals and clinics to provide some of the services that they can't. Um, but you know, they those little clinics that they have function very much like a small primary care clinic. Mm -hmm. um, can you give a perspective on opportunities to improve outcomes and reduce costs for behavioral health? using telehealth approaches? Yeah, we didn't talk about this at all, but they, um, and I'd like to say that we deliver their behavioral health by telehealth, but we don't. When we started out, we did. Um, that was a huge need for them, especially for the kids of the families. Um, what happened is that one of our uh, triple board uh, graduated physicians was seeing those those family members, he had, he was doing two or three days of clinic a week uh, at UK. Um, what he realized was he could make a whole lot more money if he quit UK and went out on his own and did this work. And so he did. Um, and so he left the university, set up his own private practice. He now does this out of his home. And I think he does four days a week of clinic with the company. And, and I can tell you, he's making a killing at it. Um, but I think that he also, I mean, he, he provides incredible service for them, is able, he's, he's medically licensed in eight different states for the company. So he can provide, and because he's triple boarded, he's both adult and child psychiatrist, so he provides services both for the adults and the kids and the families. And, and the, it, it is by far and away outside of primary care. Um, their most used telehealth application. Um, do you suggest starting out with a mobile clinic unit as a first approach, 
Could you also share the cost of the mobile unit and a specific vendor in building the unit or expand on the size of the vehicle? Yeah, um, well, what we started, I, I'm not sure that I would necessarily start with a mobile unit. Again, going back to the perfect storm analogy, there were five coal mines that probably were in 50 miles of each other. And so it worked out perfectly that the nurse practitioner could drive to any one of those five mines probably took 45 or 50 minutes for each one. Um, one of the reasons that we abandoned the, the, uh, the mobile clinic was not only did they want a clinic in every location, but that panel truck um, was a death trap on some of these small community, uh, small rural roads where the mines are. Um, more than once the brakes went out on that van and the, uh, the nurse that drove it one day just parked it on the side of the road and said, you know, get me another van, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so I don't think that the van is necessarily what you would always want to use. It worked out with us because we had multiple locations. The fit out for that van, and, and it was simple, guys. I mean, really simple setup was about $100,000. It included a traditional telehealth system, uh, they, they created a uh, just a Formica top table that was both workspace as well as a, the bed, the exam table where they would have people lay on. Um, they had an EKG machine and a defibrillator and all kind of simple devices that you would have in a clinic. Of course, they didn't have radiology services, um, but it was about $100,000 and it served its purpose for about a year and a half to two years. And after that, the company was absolutely committed that they wanted the nurse available every day of the week in the clinic. Thank you. I'm going to, it's right at the top of the hour, uh, actually a minute after. Um, I'm going to combine these last two questions before we close today. Um, is there an optimal number of employees where an on-site on clinic makes sense or below what number of employees does it not make sense to have an on-site clinic? And a great, great question, and I haven't had to deal with that. I, I, I've got to tell you guys, I don't know. Um, you, you know, I, my guess is that if you saw, you know, my guess is if you saw 10 to 15 patients a day in that clinic, it would probably warrant its, its uh, or justify its, its being. I really don't have good data. I know that there are none of the mine sites that I'm aware of have less than three or 400 employees. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's your break even point or if you could actually say if you had 300 employees that that would justify. I just know in this instance it worked for them. All right, thank you. Great, thanks Rob. If you'll hit the next slide. Um, this presentation has been part of the National Telehealth Resource Center webinar series, bringing you timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth program. The next telehealth webinar will be hosted by the California Telehealth Resource Center and presented by Dan Kurachak. The topic will be network connectivity and telemedicine, really looking at the harsh truth of the public internet, wireless and cellular access and all those other uh, broadband issues. It will be held Thursday, March 17th, 2016 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And on the next slide, um, your opinion of this webinar is really valuable to us. And Becky, I think, is going to add the link to the chat box as well. Um, if you could please just take a brief uh, moment to show us um, what you think of this webinar and um, let us know how we could improve it. And we appreciate your attendance. Thanks. It's Joe Crap's company. Yeah. There's There's um, one other question. I'm not going to ask you, Rob, um, to answer this, but 
as I was typing back and forth with someone about Medicare recognizing the visit, and I'm thinking maybe they didn't recognize the visit because the physical site wasn't a, a specific clinic. That, but there are specific yeah. sites that are reimbursable. You, you're absolutely right. You couldn't, like this would not work for Medicare because a workplace site is not a clinic. But if there was an FQHC as the provider, yeah, you do that as an offsite clinic or a, there's a special term they use. Well, you know, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because it, you know, a CMS says the office of a provider. That is the office of a provider. I mean, it's right. the office of a nurse practitioner. So mm -hmm. I, you may be able to they may be able to say, we would open this up to the community and uh, offer to see Medicare patients. That might work. Right. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Becky, and thanks, Kathy. Thank you, everyone.